Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening, I'm Yvonne Staff for Science for the Public and I welcome you to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Our distinguished guest tonight is David Kaiser of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology where he is the Germishausen Professor of History of Science, the Director of the Program in Science Technology and Society, and Senior Lecturer in the Department of Physics. He is also an MIT McVicker Faculty Fellow. Dr. Kaiser received two PhDs from Harvard University, one in physics and the other in the history of science. He joined the MIT faculty in 2000 and became director of the program in science, technology, and society in 2011. David Kaiser has two areas of research, history and physics. His historical research focuses on the development of physics in the United States during the Cold War, specifically on how physics was influenced uh, by the politics and culture of that time. His physics research is on early <laughs> universe cosmology, working at the interface of particle physics and gravitation. Dr. Kaiser has produced a number of award-winning books, including the very popular How the Hippies Save Physics. He's an elected fellow of the American <laughs> Physical Society and an editor of the journal Historical Studies in the Natural Sciences. He's received numerous honors for his work, and he's been featured in many mer uh, magazine articles and also American and British public radio programs. Tonight, Dr. Kaiser discusses the relationship between political eras and the development of critical advances in physics. He'll also tell us about his current work on the early universe. It's a very special honor to welcome David Kaiser. Welcome, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. We usually think of science as sort of out there, right. isolated, mm -hmm. but you put it squarely in a culture. Yeah. Can you give us some ideas about it? Sure. It's a, it's a very big topic, and so uh, part of, that's part of the fun is that we'll never yeah. run out of examples. Um, <laughs> but you're right, I think many people um, have, a, have a notion of science as being somehow separate from, so to speak, the real world or, or the daily lives of, of ordinary people. Um, and so it's been very fascinating as, as an historian um, to, to discover ways in which uh, scientists and scientific um, uh, knowledge making was not only sort of separated, but was really sort of thoroughly of, mm -hmm. of its time and place. Uh, and and um, and, and, that, and that we can see signs of that, that we can see traces in which it was really deeply embedded uh, as part of that world, not separate from it. Um, and so one of the things that I find uh, fun is to think about different examples of what, what should be sort of the same activity. We think, well, how do, say, theoretical physicists go about their daily mm -hmm. job? Uh, and then we can start seeing uh, really quite interesting differences in how they do that over a pretty short span of time. We don't have to go all the way back uh, very far in, in deep in the past in history or to, or, or to the far-flung reaches of the globe. We can look even, say, in the United States over the last uh, several decades or compare, yeah. say, you know, Britain and the U.S., places that look kind of similar in many ways. Um, and yet we can see pretty dramatic changes in, in, in how people have assumed uh, they should do their job. What did mm -hmm. they think it was to be, say, a scientist or a physicist in those times mm -hmm. and places? Um, one of my favorite books, actually, that got me thinking about this uh, some years ago is by a colleague, uh, Andy Warwick, who's an historian, very gifted historian. Uh, and he wrote a fascinating book on the making of young scientists in Cambridge University in the UK, mm -hmm. over really over the, the sort of 19th century, long 19th century. Um, and for, for much of that period, or certainly for, for, for many decades, uh, every single undergraduate student at Cambridge University had to prove themselves by taking an enormously complicated exam in pure mathematics. I mean, it sounds like a torture instrument today. We, we can't do that, right? Uh, and not only was, uh, was it a very, very rigorous exam itself, but they published the rank-ordered list of every sort of graduate in the national newspapers. So, I mean, imagine 
how that felt. And they were, you know, mental breakdowns and all mm -hmm. the you know, human yeah. dramas you might expect. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that Cambridge and, the, and Britain more broadly was not aiming to make, you know, 10,000 mathematical physicists, mm -hmm. not at all. Mm -hmm. it, it, the goal at the time was to produce what they considered kind of disciplined, nimble minds who could run the empire. This was the, the yeah, era when, as right. the saying went, the sun never set on right, the British Empire. Right. And so the idea was if you could prove yourself by doing incredibly hard calculus problems, then you were clearly fit to run <laughs> to you know, the <laughs> office in <laughs> India or to join the Anglican uh, clergy or whatever. And so Andy has this amazing way of, of showing how the assumptions about what higher education, what learning should be all about, really sets in motion, sets in train a series of these reforms. So we have a very, to our eyes, kind of strange looking elite, you know, inc mm -hmm, incredibly mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. uh, powerful institution that, that looks, you know, that bears the marks of time and place, right? So they trained people, uh, very smart people, very well there in ways that don't make any sense to us, right. you know, today and didn't right. make sense in other, uh, France at the time. So there are examples like that where we don't have to go too far away to find uh, uh, places where um, it's not that, s that society has sort of intervened and messed up what would have otherwise been very good science. It, elite world-class science gets done in, you know, in curious kind of place-specific ways, time-specific ways. Um, anyway, that's something that just really, really captured me, even as a young student, yeah. to think about, you know, I'm, as a college student, I was learning certain things in certain ways and working very hard at my homework right, assignments, right, as right. college students do most of the time. Um, and then to realize that that was what seemed so um, second nature, so it had to be that way, yeah. uh, was really, you know, a modeled at, at a, of a very particular moment in time. Right. So. And this has broken down at different times. Mm -hmm. The Greeks at a certain period broke all the rules, I <laughs> guess. Right. And maybe in other, case, uh, in other cases, and we're leading up to your most wonderful example of this in the United States. But before we go back to this, I'd like to ask you about how culture influenced scientists thinking mm -hmm. in some ways too, particularly in biases uh, yeah. to prove uh, mm -hmm. racism and so sure, on. Sure, yes. yes. Well, no, unfortunately, as, as you know, there's no shortage of examples right. where, again, from where we sit today, it's easier to see what, what clearly, uh, when, when things went wrong. Yeah. Right? And, uh, and th there's, a, there's a, a very rich history, alas, right. of what's often called scientific racism, or, or seemingly scientifically based theories of human origins and human difference, which today we can see was shot through with, uh, with bias and assumptions of the age that, that most of us would not put stock in today. Even though they, these ideas were uh, put forward by often very earnest, very right. smart, uh, well-educated exactly. people. Exactly. Uh, so, so there, there's uh, unfortunately a long litany of these examples, right, uh, right. And, and again, not just from long ago or far away. Um, and what, what fascinates me is that is to turn it around and see all the examples of really wonderful science, science that we yes. still hold up as exemplary today, yeah. that was no more outside of society than than those uh, quite egregious examples. Were. Right. So, so I don't see it as as a kind of you know Garden of Eden where there's a kind of pure science right. untouched by by the kind right. of. Um, it's almost like a biblical narrative, a kind yeah. of a lapsarian, like we've yeah. been pushed out of a, a pure land. I don't think we were ever in a kind of pure land. Uh, uh, and so, um, so that, that becomes the job of, of the historians, and in some sense the broader uh, public at large, to try to understand how, how are these ideas um, fitting together, making sense, um, given the kind of um, uh, ideas and resources at, at hand, uh, and that those those don't stay constant. Those change over time. Uh, and so there are, as I say, horrible examples, uh, as well as, when we look back, you know, examples of science that we still hold up and, and teach our students and, and think is, is just wonderful, still came from very specific kind of cultural and institutional moments. Right. Uh, another thing there is, we were talking a little while ago about the slow emergence mm -hmm. of real science yes. out of more mythical, mystical mm -hmm. kinds of thinking, and we were talking about very great scientists like Newton and mm -hmm. so on. And this was the nature of yes. science, at least in the West, that it mm -hmm. came about uh, in this slow progress. Yes. And yes. would you say that that's true of a lot of the sciences? Was well, true in physics and yes, that it I, came out? I certainly would. And, and uh, Newton's a wonderful example. Newton was, you know, uh, just a remarkably um, fascinating and complicated yeah, yeah. figure. Uh, and now that's going back a couple hundred years, so we could sometimes we can 
comfort ourselves. Oh, well, that was the bad old days, and now, of course, we know we've, we're so modern and, and, and we know what's, what's what. Uh, but there are examples uh, that are much closer to our own backyard mm -hmm. of uh, extremely talented uh, and, again, sort of smart and earnest and hardworking scientists, who, much of whose work we still admire and teach, who nonetheless were convinced in their day that either their favorite ideas led them to certain conclusions, mm -hmm. which we now lo no longer would see that uh, connection, or their work was inspired by mm -hmm. ideas that we might consider, you know, myth mythical or occult or somehow beyond yeah, the pale. Right. And that's not just Newton. It's not just, say, James Clark Maxwell. Much right. <laughs> Dirac. Uh, Dirac or Niels Bohr. Or yes. Eric Schroeder. Yeah. Or, uh, <laughs> Goes uh, on and on. That's a long, long right. list. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Um, and so that's another maybe a nice example of how you know, this scientists, of course, are people, they're right. humans, humans yeah. living in, in a time and place. And, um, and that, I think, accounts for the great richness of science. I don't think that's a problem to be, to be, to be solved. Right. I think that's, right. that's just how, how the world has been and, and still is. Yes, yeah. which leads us to this book, yeah. How the Hippies Save Physics. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have pointed out here, I mean, this is the thrust of the book, that these people were really out there <laughs> you know, in so yes. many ways and uh, persisted with this. Mm -hmm. And yet, the peculiarities of this time led yeah. to an enormous breakthrough. Would you step us through that? Okay. I believe that you were arguing that uh, you, you know, it, the, it was really the peculiarities of the time, and you got this yes. sort of thing, and people were able to explore right. something they hadn't. Well, anyway. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's right, and that's part of why this this time period is so fascinating. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of colorful period in American yeah, history. Right. Um, the sort of late 1960s, early 1970s, it was a, a, a whirlwind. I mean, I, yes. was, I was barely there, but I'm an historian, right. so I've been able to read and talk it with people was, who yes. were more there. Um, so it's, it's, it's a remarkable period for how the United States was changing and the comparable yes. developments in many parts of, of the world as well. Uh, politically and culturally with the various um, uh, kind of you know, long 60s revolutions that we now can sort of tick off uh, one after the other, but also intellectually, uh, in, in this case, in, in certain areas of science and physics right. and so on. Um, so what fascinated me about this group that I wound up writing about, they called themselves the Fundamental Physics Group. It was very playful. They spelled physics with an F. I would say physics students then as now never learned how to spell, <laughs> right. but, no, but they, were, they were doing it on purpose. Um, and they were a, a remarkable uh, collection of, of people on the order of about 10 kind of core uh, members of that group who found each other in the uh, early mid-1970s uh, in uh, Berkeley, California, kind of epicenter. Where else? Where else, exactly. <laughs> epicenter for this kind of new age um, mm -hmm. um, movement in North America. And what, what, I, what really grabbed me about them was that they were... Uh, exquisitely well trained. I mean, uh -huh. they had uh, PhDs in physics from some of the finest programs uh -huh. in the United States. They'd done their problem sets. Many of them had published in uh, a very good, um, we might say, mainstream work in the in the scientific journals along the way. Uh, and then they sort of hit hit the job market when the bottom fell out. This is what one uh, way where we see a very blunt version of society uh, busting in to to ordinary science. So. Um, between the late 60s and early 1970s, uh, many, many fields in academia, but physics hardest physics. of all, uh, went through a tremendous, a very rapid change. The bottom fell out, basically. Yeah. So physics had been growing uh, faster than any other field after World War II on the heels of these dramatic uh, uh, wartime projects like the atomic bomb and radar and many, many other mm -hmm. smaller projects. Uh, every field grew rapidly after World War II uh, with the influx of new students and the GI Bill and all the rest. Physics outpaced them all. Almost every field went through some sort of contraction around 1970, mm -hmm, give or take, mm -hmm. and none fell deeper, harder, faster than physics. It just was this huge bellwether for larger changes in the American Academy uh, at the time. And where does a physicist go? <laughs> and where does it go? Uh, many of them, or some of them, chose to go to California um, yeah. and sort of do what they could. And yeah. what, what they couldn't do, for the most part, was follow a kind of familiar career path. Mm -hmm. The jobs dried up very, very rapidly, much more rapidly than the student numbers did. There was a huge mismatch of, of really thousands of extremely talented, very well-trained young people in physics, engineering, mathematics, many allied fields, uh, who had uh, gone into the field with dreams of an academic career, um, were told by the federal government that the nation needed many oh, more yes. scientists and engineers in the Sputnik era, uh, and then the sort of jobs simply weren't there when they, got, when they were done. And that was true, especially of, of the folks I wound up writing most about. So they were um, sort of at the wrong place at the wrong time. So they, they kind of bumble along through different 
accidents of history and biography sort of uh, uh, bring them together in uh, Berkeley in the uh, early 70s, and they find each other. And wh what captivated me was that they had this exquisitely uh, strong discipline and training. They had done their PhDs and done extremely mm -hmm, good mm -hmm. uh, work, uh, and were suddenly kind of thrust out of a kind of comfort zone or an expected path uh, the one, uh, of the sort that they certainly had anticipated or, or been looking forward to. Uh, and so they became actually, I guess today we'd call them very entrepreneurial. I mm -hmm. mean, they really sort of made do with what they had and were very creative mm -hmm. in creating a, a kind of parallel universe mm -hmm. to the kind of um, institutions or structures that would have been familiar at the time mm -hmm. for doing mm -hmm. science. Mm -hmm. So they found their own ways to support the research. And even theoretical research is expensive because you have to eat <laughs> sometimes, mm -hmm. right? You have to pay, pay the rent. rent. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So they, they found their own uh, patrons. They found their own ways to sort of share their ideas amongst themselves as well as disseminate their work uh, in very, again, very creative, sometimes very effective, um, but kind of off the beaten path sorts of ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, and so on. So they 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 made a kind of almost like a parallel universe to the kind of modern university, um, and so they combined this uh, a certain kind of rigor with uh, and, and discipline and training with a very kind of um, in some cases free spirited, fun loving, uh, not highly structured hippie hippie <laughs> kind of creativity, being yeah, open yeah. Uh, to some pretty s strange sounding ideas. Yeah. Yes. What kinds of ideas? That's, uh, it was a, it's yes. a delicious menu. So <laughs> I mean, the, uh, so on the one hand, it included for some members, not all, but for some, it included things like ESP yeah. and spoon bending, which was um, oh the Geller thing, you right? Like yeah. you like Yuri Geller most famously in that time period. Um, that there was uh, this wasn't only the stuff of kind of small underground boutique mm -hmm. newsletters. This is the front page <laughs> of the major newspapers. The New York Times ran articles yes. on this. The yes. San Francisco Chronicle did as well as the Berkeley Bar. I mean, yeah. it really was sort of spanning the, the types of, um, of newspapers or sort of media. Yeah. So that really was literally front page news, especially in the Bay Area in that time. Um, and some of these folks were really excited about that, were either curious or true believers, or sometimes true mm -hmm, believers and mm -hmm, very mm -hmm, deep mm -hmm, skeptics. Mm -hmm, they, mm -hmm, sometimes mm -hmm. they'd oscillate. But they couldn't kind of avoid it. This was really just in their face in that time and place. Um, and on the other hand, they were also, uh, to a person, deeply fascinated by some of these kind of grand mysteries of, of modern physics, mm -hmm. um, some that still fascinate me and, and, and my mm -hmm, students mm -hmm, and many mm -hmm. in between. Topics uh, at the heart of quantum theory, some very strange ideas in relativity. Uh, and, and what was really sort of fun about this uh, time period is that for some members, not all, for some members of that group, they began to wonder if there were connections between these different right, areas. That right, that was uh, that was a point you made really yeah. well. I wanted to make that clear. Yeah, yeah and, and and so uh, to some people these were two sets of curious ideas, and right. it stopped there. Right. To others, maybe sort of the weirdnesses of quantum theory, which no matter well, how weird. we slice it, they, <laughs> yeah. they can sound awfully weird or certainly counterintuitive. Maybe those actually could account for. Maybe that explained the strangenesses of, say, e accounts of ESP or other seemingly occult phenomena. Uh, and so is, there, is, is that any stranger than other kind of strange and magical effects that, that were uh, eventually brought within the fold of, of, uh, of mainstream science? I mean, not all that much longer ago, a couple centuries, you know, magnetism seemed like you know, right. the stuff of, of spirits and, and right, the God. Right. How could this strange effect be happening? Right. And now we'd say there's nothing spooky. It's, we understand something about magnetic fields. Right. And so many of these folks wondered, is, is this the next thing? Are these strange notions of kind of consciousness, consciousness and, and, and its possible powers in the world, or, or in some cases, you know, uh, reputed powers in the world, are those the next set of phenomena that today seem spooky and tomorrow will seem tame? Mm -hmm. And they were not alone in thinking that. Mm -hmm. oh, it was uh, very popular it was very at that popular. time. All it, this paranormal yep. stuff was very That's popular. Right. It was. And, and, so, and, and what they had was, um, I say, training and inklings and curiosity in, in first principles foundational physics. Yeah. And, and an openness to some of these other topics mm -hmm, as well. And mm -hmm. that was a very, uh, and they were doing it outside the ordinary you know, kind of university environment for the most part. And so it was a very creative, kind of free-flowing uh, hodgepodge. In a university setting, mm -hmm. would that have been a bit more difficult? Like if you were in your physics, would yeah. these people have been able to talk about this in a physics class, the way that they were talking about in fundamental physics group? So it would not have been easy. It also mm -hmm. would not have been impossible. Mm -hmm. There were some folks mm -hmm. I, I wrote about briefly mm -hmm. here. They were kind of, this group was tethered to um, not just mainstream, but often very elite um, mm -hmm. physics. Mm -hmm. 
a few uh, kind of senior figures in the field shared at least an openness or a curiosity. Rarely would they share the kind of enthusiasms, uh, but they would say, well, this is curious and physicists need to be open to all things. Now that was by no means the norm, but there were some. And so there was at the time the department head of the very prestigious department at Columbia University, mm -hmm. Department of Physics, um, was at least open to some questions. He was by no means uh, um, endorsing this, but saying, well, maybe. Uh, and there were a few other people like that dotted around. It was not um, mainstream stuff, and nor am I saying it should have been. <laughs> this is not a judgment thing, but just looking at who was doing what where. It was certainly not the stuff of classroom discussion. There were pockets. There were, okay. there were nodes w to whom they could be connected. Okay. Yeah. Now, these people were all interested in quantum mechanics mm -hmm. generally, yeah. but this, this developed into something. And if I follow you correctly, it seems as though this really was a chain. Mm -hmm. That is, it was sort of causative that yeah. they they were, as you said, well-trained, mm -hmm. open mm -hmm. to some really complicated stuff. But right. having this kind of mentality at yeah. that time mm -hmm. was sort of fertile ground for yes. developing a really important breakthrough, I think. Yes. What was that? How did this work? Yeah, so what they were really captivated, among other things, by something that we now call Bell's theorem yeah. or quantum entanglement, sort of synonymous. At this well, point. that makes sense, doesn't it? Entanglement that's, with well, the psychic right. stuff, that's right? A, that was yeah. exactly what some of them thought would yeah. be the bridge, exactly. Um, and entanglement is, is really sort of can sound very spooky. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, Albert Einstein had wondered about this notion even before John Bell's work had come along, and he dismissed it as what he called spooky actions at a distance. That was not meant to be a compliment. This is just horrible. Einstein, by that point, was a really um, very trenchant critic of mm -hmm. quantum theory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he would say to his colleagues, if your equations predicted that kind of nonsense, then clearly th that's your problem. Nature can't possibly be that strange. Mm -hmm. that's, you've made a mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, that was Einstein's um, decided view. We now most would think that he lost that one. Mm -hmm. He got a lot of things <laughs> right, not everything right. Uh, but nonetheless, it does heighten the fact that this sounds awfully unusual or counterintuitive. What is entanglement? Yeah. Uh, so it, entanglement, you know, it's fu one of the fun things I had uh, most, uh, most fun in writing the book was trying to figure out how to describe entanglement. Yeah. And uh, first I thought I would just offload that to my friends and say, how my <laughs> friends describe entanglement. That didn't help. Uh, there are some wonderful <laughs> metaphors people have developed. They get increasingly kind of Byzantine. But it only accentuates the fact that it's, it really is a challenge to yeah. put it into kind of ordinary language. So here's, a, here's one try. Uh, entanglement concerns certain kinds of, of systems, quantum, uh, say pairs of quantum particles, that could be uh, prepared a certain way. They could say be shot out from a source. They could have a common origin yeah. and some source, almost like a radioactive source, not so bizarre, could spit out pairs of particles. The strangeness comes when we try to describe what's going to happen to particle B given what we know has to happen to particle A. What it really boils down to is that, it's in, according to quantum theory at least, it's impossible to give a description of particle B without mm -hmm. referring in mm -hmm. a very mm -hmm. concrete way to particle mm -hmm. A, mm -hmm. that their, if you like, their fates are linked, to speak metaphorically. There's no way to describe a self-contained description of particle B that doesn't also already include something about what happens over here. So that starts to sound like if I do something here, it should have an effect mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Immediately, right? Immedi according to the equations, it should be an, an instant mm -hmm. kind of connection of some mm -hmm. vague sort. John Bell himself, a marvelous, a very, very creative and talented physicist um, who, who helped kind of clarify this uh, in 1964. We just celebrated the 50th anniversary of this work recently. Uh, he actually shared ideas much like Einstein's. He thought this mm -hmm. sounds kind of weird. So he was the one who upped the ante and showed that this was an inescapable prediction from quantum theory. It wasn't so clear, was this, you know, did the equations require that or was it a misunderstanding? John Bell, among other things, clarified that this really is a, a hard prediction for quantum theory. Uh, and then the question was, well, is that true of the world or is that just true on our, on our scratch pads? Uh, that, that, these, that the behavior of these two particles is, is indeed some, somehow deeply entwined, uh, inescapably entwined, if quantum theory is right. Uh, and Bell, frankly, hoped it would not. He hoped there would be a view mo more like Einstein's, um, as he wrote many times uh, later in life. Um, so it does sound spooky, and it sounds like, you know, what I do here could somehow could possibly have an impact over there, mm -hmm. faster than s the speed of light, faster mm -hmm. than ordinary mm -hmm. messages mm -hmm. could have traveled mm -hmm. between us. 
And then, as you say, if you if one is immersed in Berkeley in 1975, <laughs> and on the front page of the regular yeah. newspapers, the stories about ESP and telekinesis, and now you're thinking about spoons and everything, and yeah. we're all connected. And we're yeah, all one. Right. You can see very quickly this, yes. this, this this might might be heightened as a yeah, topic of yeah, real curiosity. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. What was the upshot of this? Uh, yeah. So I should say, so quantum mechanics by this point was very, very well accepted. And in fact, mm -hmm. every physics student had to take mm -hmm. multiple courses in quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics was, was at the heart of the mainstream <coughs> by, by this period, by the, really by the 1950s and certainly by the 60s and 70s. But these weirder elements, these things like Bell's theorem and quantum mm -hmm. tangle, those were not in the textbooks. Those were I not see. what was taught uh, in, the, in the ordinary students' training. So, as I say, John Bell derived this very elegant um, proof that one can't escape this kind of behavior, at least within quantum theory. That was in 1964, pr almost a decade, or the better part of a decade went by before most physicists even took notice. Some of the first to take notice, in fact, were these folks that I wound mm -hmm, up writing mm -hmm. about, uh, who were well ahead of the curve. We'd call them like early adopters today. Um, that they saw this was fascinating, and it really seemed to point to the, some of the deepest, juiciest questions of, you know, what's the world made of? How does the world work? Mm -hmm. The kinds of, of questions that had brought them, got them excited as young people in physics in the first place. The questions that got me excited about physics mm -hmm. as a young mm -hmm. person, for that matter. Um, and yet we're not part of the ordinary curriculum, uh, not in the textbooks by mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they were among the first to say, there's something here. This, this mm -hmm. really is, it is counterintuitive, it's strange, and yet, you know, we have the tools to try to, to pursue it. Especially for them, one of the things that they were hooked on was this fast, this seeming faster than light question. Mm -hmm. about if I do something to particle A here, does its twin respond really faster than light could have traveled? Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. it really mm -hmm. instantaneous? I, I often make the joke that you know, if, if you tell a bunch of physicists that something happens faster than light, it, it makes the hairs stand on end. I mean, for me, you you couldn't tell, of course. But you know, but this is just—it's not supposed to happen yeah, since relativity. Right, Nothing right. should be able to travel right, faster than right. light. No, no physical force or effect should, should right. be instantaneous. Yeah. And here it is at the, at the cornerstone of modern physics, uh, this proof that at least the equations suggest this is an inescapable um, consequence. Mm -hmm. So it looks like we're on a collision course. We have two major pillars for modern physics, relativity, which sets the sort of speed mm -hmm. limit, mm -hmm. the speed mm -hmm. of light, mm -hmm. uh, and then quantum theory, which is at least skirting around that. It's certainly mm -hmm. pointing mm -hmm. to some mm -hmm. curious kinds of long distance uh, uh, um, connections. And so members of this group, some of them because they thought it would crack the nature of consciousness, some of them because they thought it was just a juicy problem and sort of everywhere in between, really hammered, really drilled on mm -hmm. that. Is, is quantum theory compatible with relativity? Does something like entanglement sort of fight the other grand pillar? Is the whole edifice you know, about to shake down? Or is mm -hmm. there some mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. subtle mm -hmm. way that they'll fit together? And so in the, they developed a series of thought experiments, very clever ones, I, I think, a whole series of them, more and more kind of um, uh, almost Rube Goldberg kind of clever uh, uh, bells and whistles to try to harness this effect from quantum theory to, to beat relativity. Mm -hmm. If this quantum effect is real, and there was mm -hmm. more and more reason to think it was real, uh, then could you harness that to send signals faster than light? Could you affect uh -huh. something over here faster than over mm -hmm. here? Let alone could you, could you then explain telekinesis? But just in general, could we, could we get parts of physics to fight, basically? And, uh, and some of the first examples, uh, were people were, other people were able to say, oh, no, here, there's a loophole. Oh, you, you missed this very subtle point. These were not trivial uh, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. uh, errors. Mm -hmm. They were what I like now to call productive mistakes. I mean, even the authors uh, of these ideas, these so-called hippies, they'll admit they were, they were mistakes, but they were very, very juicy ones, very mm -hmm, subtle mm -hmm, ones. Mm -hmm. They're the kind that figuring out what went wrong is itself educational. Exactly. Right? That's right. the best kind of, maybe right. we all make right. such mistakes, exactly. right? Einstein made these sort of mistakes, mm -hmm. Richard Feynman made these, mm -hmm. that's the best kind of mistake mm -hmm. to make, mm -hmm. it seems to me. And, and these folks were finding very clever um, sort of tests, trials, and then often it was some members of the group, often other members, other people, yeah. who would finally sort of shoot them down, show why they won't work as, as, as advertised. And so there, there was a kind of cat and mouse game. To say, well, okay, you found that you, you, my first design wouldn't work to harness this feature of quantum theory, but what about this one? I've now mm -hmm. countered mm -hmm. your, your mm -hmm. concern there. And that went on for, for many years and got, you know, it was very playful, done with a great spirit of, of fun and, and kind of intellectual adventure, and really led to insights that we all now take for granted, insights that are into the opening pages of some of our new textbooks in quantum theory. Hmm. That, that, in fact, there is a kind of a, a peaceful coexistence between quantum entanglement and relativity, and we know we now know why they fit together. They don't fight each other. 
uh, thanks to the efforts of this group and 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 their you know their their dialogue partners. Right. It wasn't only them, but they were they were really instigators. Right. Yeah. Did this lead also to the development of? quantum information theory and the idea of uh, quantum for communication. It, it did. So it, it indirectly, I mean, certainly mm -hmm. that's a, it's a sprawling topic with by now tens of thousands mm -hmm. of researchers around the world, many of them at MIT, but really everywhere now. Um, so the argument, not, argument I'm making is certainly not that these folks invented quantum information science. Mm -hmm. There are a couple mm -hmm. important mm -hmm. steps mm -hmm. in between. But the ideas they were wrestling with mm -hmm. And mostly the, the, the incredible creativity to shoot those ideas down, the, the, to show that those were productive mistakes. Productive, yes, but they were mistakes. Mm -hmm. The reason their, their ideas would not work, those had, uh, we might now say, very lucky unintended consequences because we now use those intellectual tools to design things like quantum encryption, uh, quantum yeah. teleportation, and all the rest. Right. So, so these, the, this group... On the one hand, they were, as I say, they kind of helped discover Bell's theorem or quantum entanglement at all. This was, this was really not a, a mainstream topic. And they pushed and pushed and pushed and helped bring attention to it and helped get other people to pay attention. And that already is, is I think, a great good thing. Mm -hmm. And this notion of quantum entangle, can, entanglement or entangled states, that really is the, the, from which all these wonderful new uh, next generation devices will come. Quantum computing yeah, depends right. at step one on sort of the reality of quantum entanglement. Quantum encryption, quantum teleportation. So these folks helped bring attention to Bell's theorem at all. And then even when you get to the real nitty gritty, the real n finer points of how does entanglement work on its own right? Mm -hmm. What are the limits? Mm -hmm. How does it uh, uh, obey relativity, even though on the face it looks like they're headed for, for uh, conflict? Those also now are like wired into our protocols for, say, quantum encryption. So those didn't come only from these folks. Right, these folks right, pushed right, and pushed right. and said, this is really interesting and important and juicy. Right. And then many, more and more people then uh, did. Uh, but in. it seemed like they opened the gates in so many ways by doing a lot of work around it that might have been more difficult. I think they did. And, and, you know, and delayed if they had Certainly, right. Uh, I think that's fair to say. And, w and among the things they did is they helped um, smuggle this back into classrooms. So this had mm -hmm. not been in the classrooms when they were students yeah. uh, or their peers. But they both wrote the first kind of lesson plans or helped inspire work with the people who wrote the right. first lesson plans. And some of their um, book, books that went on to become bestsellers that were not written oh, to be yes, textbooks that's right, that's actually right. had a kind of second became, life in the classroom. Isn't that um, interesting? So, yes. yeah, so, so they were, uh, and these books were often very well positively received in the, in the mm -hmm. mainstream mm -hmm. physics community mm -hmm. you know, after years had passed. Um, they were on the syllabi, you know, when I was a student many years later. How about as, that? As you know, supplementary reading. Right, but they were, they're, right. they're real resources. Yeah. Uh, and so in that sense, I think they did help to plant the seeds. They're not, yeah. they don't deserve all the credit. They deserve right. some. They really but were at it. Of quite a few got major prizes, didn't they? Their, their uh, books uh, have done well. Yeah. Uh, no, so, I was um, getting, I was, uh, uh, aspect? Uh, well, so, uh, and John Clauser is really Clauser, one of the first. Clauser. who who uh, did share this wonderful, wonderful prize called the Wolf, Wolf Prize, prize. That was uh, that as recently as 2010. Uh, which is often seen as the kind of step before the Nobel yeah. Prize, and I hope that's true in this case. I think yeah, it would be a great, right. a great, uh, certainly well deserved for right. for Clauser, uh, Alan Espe, uh, right. and then Anton Zeilinger. If say that trio it's shared it, one. I think uh, it's overdue. In yeah, my, in my opinion. Right, yeah. but a tremendous breakthrough in any case. In now. There's one more thing about yeah. this group before we leave it. Uh, they were associated with some pretty weird institutes <laughs> and the yes. CIA. Yes. Was this just because we need funding and they took it where they could get it? Well, or? I don't think it was just that. I mean, partly it was this entrepreneurial side. You're, you're mm -hmm. certainly right. They were, you know, they they weren't applying to the NSF <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> National Science Foundation uh, for the most part, uh, and so they they did need resources, very yeah. modest yeah. resources. And on the other hand, the CIA in some sense came to them, or uh -huh. to, to people with whom they were associated. Uh, so, and that again goes to this kind of cultural moment. There were all these, um, at one time, highly classified um, intelligence reports, many of them released through Freedom of, of Information Act years later, uh, where independent of this activity, uh, analysts in the Defense Intelligence Agency, the yeah. DIA, which was actually within the Pentagon, and then also within the CIA, which is similar, but sort of separate agency, uh, they, uh, some of them became convinced that um, the Soviets were way ahead of us mm -hmm. in uh, mind wars. I mm -hmm. mean, how do you ever, I was 
say the same thing. How did you get resources in the Cold War? You just say the, the Soviets were doing more of it. Yeah, and, and then you got your, and yes, then, you know, the exactly, heavens opened and, exactly. Uh, and there were uh, reports that we now know of throughout the early 1970s that alleged um, that the Soviets were pouring enormous resources into mind reading and perhaps mind control. control Think yeah. about uh, older films like The Manchurian Candidate. Yes. I mean, this mm -hmm. was, again, of, of, the, of the moment, of mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. And so some members of these um, intelligence agencies actually approached researchers who had interests in these areas and said, you know, in effect, your nation needs you. It's time to invest in um, things like ESP. And all the better if the physicists said, some physicists said, well, they might have an actual explanation, mm -hmm, whether it's mm -hmm, from entanglement mm -hmm, or something mm -hmm, else. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the money did indeed start rolling. Uh, and uh, as far as we can tell now, there are upwards of $25 million spent on that over, say, a 20-year period. And that, that, that is real money. It's sort of rounding years. It's chump change compared mm -hmm. to, say, defense oh, appropriations. Oh, I should say. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. And so this was money that was often done kind of discretionary. This was mm -hmm. not subject mm -hmm. to, to large peer review or oversight. It was, it was large money in absolute terms, small money compared to the kind of big ticket items that might have invited more oversight. So there was a, there was a, 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 a long-standing program. That's right. You mentioned also that this had a, a real influence on subsequent uh, training, educated, the way scientists are trained. And of course, we're in the middle of ha how d uh, many countries are in the middle of this dilemma of how to train students mm -hmm. just in yes. K-12, not uh, just in science and math generally. Right. How did this change? You mentioned that it brought in some unusual books. Uh, <laughs> and, it did. Uh, but did you do you see that there has been a change in training of say scientists? I would now I wouldn't put that um, all in, in, in right, the right, right, here, right. As we as we take a longer as view, a longer exactly. I think that's right. So one of the things that I found really fascinating um, in doing the work f f for the book was looking at how, what was it like to be trained in say quantum mechanics um, at the era when these folks were mm -hmm, themselves mm -hmm. you know say college students and doing their graduate work in in the nineteen fifties and nineteen sixties. And uh, by and large, there was an enormous um, accumulation of, of, of very effective ways to teach quantum theory, but to teach certain aspects of quantum theory, certain styles of teaching quantum theory. Um, so the students got very good at solving incredibly hard problems. Mm -hmm, the problem mm -hmm. sets were not easy by any measure. Right. What was sure. kind of bled out or really uh, de-emphasized during this 1950s and 60s, mostly in the U.S., some, to some degree elsewhere, was the kind of more open-ended, speculative, interpretive, we might say mm -hmm. philosophical mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. The what does it all mean stuff. Mm -hmm. and because you know, whether it's entanglement or even much older th um, paradoxes like Schrodinger's cat or all these kind of strange mm -hmm. sounding mm -hmm. ideas, mm -hmm. the uncertainty principle. You know, they, they're, there's something unlike what most of us take for granted every day that seems to be going on with, with, this, with this theory. It's, an ex it's a, in my opinion, a beautiful theory, mm -hmm. quantum mm -hmm. mechanics by now exquisitely well tested, mm -hmm. and yet it's, it's not like it's sort of just what we expected, right? It mm -hmm, still has mm -hmm. these deeply, you know, I would say, deliciously counterintuitive um, features to it. And in the earlier period, before World War II in this country, it was common for even very advanced students to really have to practice, to, do, to write essays, mm -hmm. explaining what they thought the kind of quantum weirdness was all about, give their own interpretation of the equations. They had to learn the equations, manipulate them with great mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. agility, but also step back and kind of put into words, what do they think is going on here? What does this mean compared to what we might have expected otherwise? And then during the, uh, if fast forward a few decades, by the 50s and 60s, that part had really just dropped out. Mm -hmm. It's not in the textbooks. It's not in the exams that we now find filed in various archives. Uh, it's not on the homework assignments and so on. Uh, and so that period, which is when these folks were themselves going through training, what it meant to be a physicist, you know, was uh, had certain kind of parameters, certain boundaries mm -hmm, to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and what happened when that whole system kind of cracked or went through a real uh, moment of, of, of deep change with the job crunch and the fallen funds and the real kind of... Um, a real, a real pivot point uh, around 1970 was that additional means of trying to be a physicist kind of crept back in. They weren't mm -hmm. invented whole cloth. Mm -hmm. In some mm -hmm. sense, they were almost a return in, in the style, mm -hmm. in, in an emphasis, to the way students had trained at MIT and Caltech and the best places, Berkeley, in the 30s, 1930s. There was space again. There was, it was considered legitimate, a place at the table by the time the 1970s or early, early 80s. By, by that time period, it was 
considered legitimate again to wonder about the kind of quantum mysteries, not at the expense of learning how to manipulate the equations and do very careful discipline work, but that that was somehow not the sum total of, of mm -hmm, manipulating mm -hmm, of learning quantum mm -hmm. mechanics. So we see these kind of sea changes. And, and the hippies are at that, they illustrate a transitional moment. Mm -hmm. They don't cause mm -hmm. by themselves okay. by any means mm -hmm. what comes later, but they show us that kind of unstable moment of transition mm -hmm. where what seemed obvious in one era is, is clearly about to give way to, to, a, to a, a different set of assumptions of mm -hmm. what it is to be a, 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 a highly trained smart scientist. Mm -hmm. So when we get to uh, you know, um, places like MIT today, all, mm -hmm. all over the world, not just MIT, you know, there are courses in the foundations of quantum mechanics. There are whole courses in the interpreting these equations mm -hmm. uh, and not just manipulating them. Both mm -hmm. are really important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are uh, exciting developments in, you know, in, in, this, in areas that had once been deemed not science. Not in 1600, but in you know, 1965. In, in relatively recent times, mm -hmm. areas that had once seemed simply beyond the pale. And I don't mean ESP. I mean this, just trying mm -hmm. to, what, what does it mean to wonder about Right. Quantum entanglement, right? right? That's now front and center, uh, and I'd say, you know, thank goodness, that's yes, a good thing. Absolutely. And, and more broadly, there, there's a there's a space for a kind of interpretive or, or open-ended, more more speculative um, approach to physics. Not all or nothing. Now we have, we might say, a, a broader spectrum, uh, and that that's real physics too. I so, see. That's yeah. good. And then your department adds some other dimension to yeah. this, correct? Which seems like uh, it it's, uh, should be essential everywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the uh, Science, Technology, and Society program mm -hmm. at MIT, could you tell us a little bit about yeah. that? Sure. So um, MIT's program uh, is among the earliest to be found, at least in North America. It's about 40 years old. Uh, and so it's, um, we have a collection of faculty, we have mm -hmm. undergraduate courses, uh, graduate program, we train PhD students. And it really is um, an effort to understand, in some, in some broad sense, um, how do sciences and technologies, engineering, how do they emerge from the, 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 the world, the mm -hmm. messy worlds mm -hmm. of science and mm -hmm. politics mm -hmm. and culture, uh, and how, are they, how do they remain embedded in them? Mm -hmm. And so, um, whether it's, that's a, a, a concern to unmask the kind of hidden biases, as in earlier eras of, say, scientific racism, as we mentioned before, mm -hmm. very stark examples mm -hmm. of what mm -hmm. looked like kind of best science, in fact, was clearly reflective of a set of other um, uh, societal assumptions. Or indeed, uh, say, like the Hippies book, or many of my colleagues' uh, fascinating works, to say even, even work that we might hold up to this day is kind of um, illustrative or, mm -hmm. or, or luminous examples mm -hmm. of science. Mm -hmm. Again, that's, that's not coming from outside of the world. Mm -hmm. um, one way I like to think about it is, is to say, um, you have all sciences embedded in, in politics. That doesn't make the science wrong, but it does make us wonder about you know, choices that are made. Why was that, direct, why was that scientific question prioritized over others? Mm -hmm. Why were those people able to pursue that then and there? And that could be for, frankly, perfectly good, understandable reasons. But the science doesn't just happen on its own. Mm -hmm. um, you know, an example that, that I've been thinking about for a, a different book project that's still in the works uh, is about Einstein's general relativity, a, a, a crowning achievement, I, I would think, of, um, of Einstein's own career of the 20th century. I think it's just- And of science. And of period. science, it's just gorgeous. Um, and at, at many, many moments over the, over the past centuries, now coming up on his 100th anniversary in 2015, uh, this seemingly otherworldly, sort of austere, mm. ivory tower seeming kind of uh, set of ideas was just thoroughly enmeshed in, in sometimes the messiest, messiest of the 20th century, mm -hmm. from the trench warfare of World War I to the rise of the Nazis to nuclear weapons mm -hmm. uh, development in the United mm -hmm. States mm -hmm. to concerns about Soviet you know, missiles. Mm -hmm. th it, was, it was part of the world. Uh, and so for many, many years, one of the most quantitatively accurate tests of general relativity, one of the reasons we, we had most confidence to believe these other, and so strange sounding ideas mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. warping space time mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, whimsical sounding things, that came from, uh, from very sensitive uh, experimental tests performed uh, at a defense laboratory that was aiming to, to figure out uh, early warning of incoming Soviet oh, missiles. Oh, is that Lincoln Laboratory? The Lincoln Laboratory, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, as a kind of byproduct, an, at first unanticipated byproduct, of trying to get very, very um, uh, elaborate radar systems mm -hmm. to scan the horizons, mm -hmm. to watch for incoming missiles, mm -hmm. to maybe have half an hour of warning to evacuate cities. And this is, this is mm -hmm. the messy world mm -hmm. that plays. Mm -hmm. This is the Cold War nuclear age. 
um, that in the process of fine-tuning those radars, calibrating the whole system, it turns out there were very few uh, missiles coming over the horizon. There, there were zero, thank, <laughs> thank, thank goodness. So they couldn't just say, well, we'll wait for the next 50 missiles and see what we see, because they weren't coming, thankfully. But other smart people realized that some of the planets in the solar system would look a lot like a missile at that stage of its trajectory. If you could send radars to the planet Venus, mm -hmm. then you could do target practice mm -hmm. and figure out how this whole complicated, state-of-the-art, highly uh, um, you know, high-priority defense system is going to work. Uh, and so as a byproduct of trying to fine-tune a defense system to worry about if and when Boston or New York City will be incinerated in nuclear holocaust, mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm, that's just the world mm -hmm. we're coming from, we have emerging from there in very ingenious and creative ways a, a sort of beautiful uh, test of general relativity. Mm -hmm. So th that's, I, I go into that as an example of you know, this is not, so even a theory is like uh, seemingly sort of pure abstract right, general relativity, right, it's, right. it's of the world. Right. And we, we, we gain knowledge of it in the world. And sometimes because culture and politics of the day prioritize this system over that. So, so that kind of work is what uh, my colleagues, my students, and I mm -hmm. um, are really fascinated by mm -hmm, in, mm -hmm, in mm -hmm, MIT's mm -hmm. uh, STS program. Right, mm -hmm. and it sounds like a wonderful program, by the way. Yeah. So I'll make sure that we're linked uh, to it on, right. your, on your page. I'd like to ask you, as we're winding down yeah. here, uh, you've written a great number of books, a great number, mm -hmm. um, and I will show some when we, uh, uh, with the, on the video. Okay. But, um, do you, first of all, do you have a favorite or two? Mm -hmm. And then I would like to talk about what you're working on now. Sure. Well, of course, they're like children. You can't play thick right. fingers. But right. I will say, I mean, um, working on the Hippies book, every single day that I got to work on that was just fun. How about that? Uh, it's yeah. a great, great privilege to be a university professor. To, it's a wonderful job description. Mm -hmm. uh, and on top of that, I mean, even a, a step or two above that, certainly for me, I uh, was getting to kind of immerse myself in that world, um, and and that just every, every moment of that was was really a, it was a joy. Um, you know, my first book uh, has a I have a different kind of sense of affection for. Um, was trying to understand how did Richard Feynman's oh, very yes. quirky sort of idiosyncratic yeah, approach right, to quantum right. physics become how sort of we all see the world today? We in physics all see the world, um, and that again was was. Um, uh, it was it was a great privilege to get to work on that. So you know, they, they've all been um, fun. Well, um, I'm glad because you produced a great oh, number yeah. of them. Very <laughs> readable, very interesting. Good. The public appreciates this no, very much because you. we need to hear from <laughs> the scientific world. You are working on some rather interesting things just now. Could you tell us a little bit what sure. you're up to? Uh, yeah, no, I'd be glad to. So This um, is your physics work now. Uh, right. right. So. Uh, one of the things that I get to do a lot, uh, which is really fun, is to think about the very earliest moments of our universe. Oh, um, we are all thinking about that, yes. Yeah, no, I, who, who doesn't? I know. Um, but it, it, it's, it's a wonderful time to be working in, in cosmology yeah. today. Yes, it evidently. really is uh, extraordinary. Um, and so one of the, um, so w with uh, my, my mentor and my, now my very dear friend, Alan Guth, um, we have a whole group, a g kind of gaggle of students from undergraduates through graduate students and postdocs. It's a remarkable, thriving group, and, and it's a real privilege to be able to work with them and, and with Alan. And we're really curious about, um, given what we know about matter at its most fundamental, uh, that obeys quantum theory and the uncertainty mm -hmm, principle and mm -hmm, all these mm -hmm, kind of mm -hmm. abstract ideas, and given what we know about Einstein's relativity and the stretching and warping of space-time, can we kind of fit together um, a, a coherent picture, a coherent story of how our own universe uh, could have and maybe actually did behave in, in sort of in otherwise impossibly distant kind of um, conditions, uh, very high energies, very dense right. uh, states, not like what we'd find ourselves in today. Uh, and if so, could we make predictions? If, if that had really happened, 14 billion years ago, what might we see today? What should we see as remnants of that in the mm -hmm, sky mm -hmm, and the mm -hmm. distribution of matter? Um, and uh, roughly speaking, it matches uh, unbelievably well, mm -hmm, beautifully mm -hmm, well. Mm -hmm. Very specific quantitative predictions now about um, little uh, wiggles in the distribution of light from the earliest moments that we had light streaming to us after the Big Bang, again, approximately 14 billion years ago. And we can now, sta satellites and ground-based and balloons, mm -hmm, all these mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. instruments can now measure this cosmic microwave background mm -hmm, radiation mm -hmm. to, to amazing precision. Uh, 
and there really are bumps and wiggles. There are there are patterns in in that. The the light does not all have exactly the same energy mm -hmm, at every place mm -hmm, in the sky. Mm -hmm, it has mm -hmm. almost exactly the same energy mm -hmm. in tiny little fluctuations aw away from that central value, and the patterns of those deviations match unbelievably well to our ideas uh, of where those bumps should have come from, which comes brings us right back to the the heart of, of matter at its most fundamental. Mm -hmm, it's a very mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm, it's a wonderful mm -hmm, time mm -hmm. to study these things. When is your book coming out, this one that you're doing with Alan. With Gould. Alan, well. <laughs> and, uh, I should mention, by the way, who is famous for developing the inflation after That's the right. Big Bang, which is still full of problems, I suppose, but it was, I guess, the best answer, right? That, well, that, I, what I they mean, thought. I would say the cup is more than half full. It's okay. Half empty, but it, it's, it's certainly, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a remarkable um, set of ideas. So Alan and I uh, began working with this group of students uh, about uh, three years ago. And he's been teaching a, a wonderful undergraduate course uh, in early universe cosmology at MIT for many years. And I began writing little primers to help our students. We realized, let's, let's put these together. There might be a book there. So uh, when will it come out? I, I, ah, no time okay. soon. It's, it's very much in progress. But okay. it's, 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 yeah, um, it's right. a great pleasure to work on it. And we hope to bring it together you know, right. in the next year or two, we hope. Well, so. you do a lot of very exciting things. So I think your mind must be busy <laughs> at all times, 24-7. It's very inspiring. Oh, thank you. And I have to stop here, but I really appreciate your talking with us about this. I wish you the very best of fortune for <laughs> it's such a huge contribution to the general public. Well, thank you. Thank you very and, much. Uh, uh, I will stop here and let you talk to some people. Wonderful. And uh, thank you again. Okay, well, it's, um, thank you so much for uh, sharing with us tonight. Um, sure. I'm about halfway through uh, your book. Um, mm -hmm. And I have several questions, but I'll just start out with uh, one. I think you wrote a piece um, a couple of months ago mm -hmm. in the New York Times yeah. uh, saying that uh, Bell's theorem was going to be put to a new test. Yes. I'm just wondering if there was a result as to, uh, from that experiment yet. No, no. Oh, um, we haven't run the experiment yet. It mostly goes back to what we were just talking about. Mostly um, we need money. Experiments are expensive, uh, as I'm learning. And so um, we are, so my students and colleagues are busy trying to uh, flesh out their very specific plans, first of all. So what, which <clears throat> objects in the sky should we be focusing on, which quasars, for example, among the million that have been cataloged by astronomers, what ones satisfy these very particular constraints to make sure they have, um, <clears throat> they were, weren't able to talk with each other in the history of the universe. Um, and that's really fun, but still work that on goes. Uh, as well as um, saying, you know, this is expensive, we need some more resources. Um, we write grant proposals and all the rest. So w with luck, we could do the first round of kind of pilot test, perhaps as er within, maybe as early as within the year, or maybe a year and a half. Um, and that would be a kind of proof of principle experiment, looking not at, at very distant quasars, but at nearer stars in our own galaxy. So that makes things a lot easier. It wouldn't be a full test that we envision, but it would show that we could, we could do it. And then, um, with more money and more time, um, we'd love to mount the full version, maybe by 2017, 2018, uh, where we'd actually be shooting these entangled particles between islands in the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa, uh, approximately 100 miles apart. Uh, and then, at the same time, having telescopes focus on these very distant objects, these quasars, to, to determine what aspects of those, in, of those earthbound particles we want to measure. And so we want to use the stars, or very distant objects, to help determine what properties of that light, those entangled particles, we actually subject to test, and then see do, do the kind of quantum predictions uh, still get borne out. So it's, I mean, again, it's, it's enormously fun to, to think about. And um, it just takes a little more time and money. So. You probably have to go into this without any bias, but what do you think <laughs> you're going to find? Oh, I, you know, I, right. I have plenty of bias. Um, but I, so I expect we'll find exactly the predictions of quantum mechanics. Um, and that would be a great thing. I mean, that would be um, really closing down as much as, I, as my students and I argue, as much as, we, as anyone could in our universe, closing down kind of rivals or alternatives to quantum theory, um, which are um, not always sort of aesthetically pleasing alternatives, but that are also not ruled out. They really are um, logically still in play, e even given 40 years of very clever tests of entanglement along the way. They've always been subject to these so-called loopholes, every known test so far. Uh, and, and that's not just a problem for kind of philosophy. It's uh, if these rival theories that are not quantum mechanics, 
if they're still viable in the world, then this whole machinery that we were talking about a while ago about quantum encryption is at least in principle vulnerable. It might not really be in practical terms, but, but part of the appeal of quantum encryption is that it should be uh, guarded by the laws of nature, not just guarded because it's hard for computers to scramble certain numbers as a kind of practical matter, but the real, the real beauty, I think, uh, of, or the real pleasing aspect of quantum encryption is that nature behaves this way and that disallows anyone, no matter how clever, to, to hack into your signal, right? Uh, and that, that sureness, that, that foundation, rests upon quantum mechanics governing the world and not some of these kind of woolly sounding alternatives. Those alternatives, though not pretty, are not ruled out yet. We'd love to really say we've just we've put, the, put the, you know, the squeeze on them. On the other hand, look, if, if we found convincing evidence that quantum mechanics wasn't describing the world on these scales, then of course that's even more exciting. Then who, who knows what goes on? Um, if I had to place money, I'd say the bet is quantum mechanics really does describe the world, and we'd, and we'd hopefully show that on, the kind of, on a grand, grand scale. So, yeah. Uh, I would just say this. Um, in your book, you mention about the whole um, kind of pragmatic shut up and calculate yes. mentality and how this was, um, um, in, in a sense, maybe not intentional, but just kind of a naturally born reaction to that mm -hmm. based on the time and the, the, uh, the events of the times and the kind of thinking. Right. Um, and I would think that that was courageous. I mean, these students who have a reputation that they're cultivating, I'm, I'm assuming that um, to go out on a limb and mm -hmm. like look at, um, you know, something that may be considered meta science, pseudoscience yes. or something like that takes right. a lot of courage, mm -hmm. but also might be um, something that's uh, it, it critical in terms of really finding deep truths. What do you see that's happening today yeah. that might be like that, where people might be subject to a lot of criticism, but yeah. maybe they're, they're just being very courageous? It's a great question. And, you know, I, I wish I knew in some sense that I'd know what to go, you know, direct my own students to what, what to work on. What's going to be the next big breakthrough that everyone is, is you know, dismissing today? I, the fact is, I, you know, I don't know. Um, I take heart in the notion that there is a much broader sense of what counts as kind of legitimate science, or say just in the case of physics, a much broader sense today than there was um, uh, as I read the historical record you know, several decades ago. And again, that's not, that sounds like you know, today's good and yesterday's bad. I mean, there was amazing progress made in the 1950s and 60s. Tons of Nobel Prizes. Um, you know, people learned things about the world then that we still take for granted today. So it's not that this is all good or bad, but there are, you know, choices get made. There's styles that become kind of um, cultivated. Uh, and, uh, and certain kinds of questions, questions can flourish maybe more easily in one sort of regime than another. And I think we're in a, in a time period today where there's recognized room for a variety of approaches. That doesn't mean we're all, you know, gonna f on the right path, right? And most of us will be wrong most of the time. But I think the, the boundaries of, of someone saying that's simply not science, it, there certainly are boundaries, but I think there, there may, be, may be a bit broader, a bit looser, um, I mean, friends of mine work on ideas today that, that really do, that, that, can, that can sound pretty outrageous or, or, or silly or, or who knows what. Um, the multiverse, alternate universes, you know, um, extra dimensions of space that no one's actually ever seen any evidence for. I mean, on the face of it, those, those could sound as um, ungrounded or as metaphysical or you, you name the, you, you supply your adjective you'd like. Uh, as what had once passed for you know, merely the occult. That doesn't mean that stuff's right today. It does mean, uh, though, that there is room for real smart physicists to study that and to publish in the leading journals and to teach courses in that. So that's why I, I think there's a, a kind of broader range of what counts as, as legitimate these days. There are limits. Are we still missing things at the boundaries from our own blind spots or biases? I, I imagine we likely are. I'm, I'm sure I am. You know, I, um, but, but I think that, that kind of very characteristic moment of the shut up and calculate, I think there's plenty of that kind of uh, science today which, is, which can lead to very good and important science, but that's not sort of the only game in town, the way I think it was more or less dominant at, earlier on.